All right, we should be. All right, it says mute. For now, are we good? It says mute on the bottom. Oh, now, mm -hmm. never mind. <laughs> well, um, good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming, especially to those of you in person that we got a chance to chat a little bit today. Um, my name is Christy Dupreis. I work here at Womble. Uh, we just moved to these new offices and we're happy to actually have you guys as our very first guests. <laughs> um, so thank you for coming. Um, this is Kate Johnson. She also works with me at Womble and we're excited to host today. Um, I get the privilege of introducing this awesome group of ladies that are going to talk to you um, and then get and then sit back and listen to their expertise. Um, so I'm going to do that quickly. Um, Denise Sailorou um, is an Atlanta based jury consultant um, and trial consultant specializing in jury selection, witness preparation, pretrial research, such as focus groups mock, and mock trials and trial strategy. She consults on trials throughout the United States in both criminal and civil cases and in federal and state court. She's been a jury consultant on a number of high profile cases, such as the United States versus Theodore Kaczynski, the Unabomber, um, the state of Georgia versus Ray Lewis, and the um, United States versus Richard Scrooge. Scrooge, thank you, <laughs> the first CEO to face charges under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and was acquitted of all charges. She has taught on the faculty at Georgia State University College of Law and is a frequent speaker at continuing legal education programs across the country. Um, so thank you for being with uh, us. My pleasure. Um, we also have Dr. Erin Tone. Erin um, is a psychology professor and director of the clinical trial, director of clinical training at Georgia State University, where she came in 2005 after four years as a postdoctoral fellow at the National Institute of Mental Health. Her research, which focuses on the ways in which emotional states, particularly anxiety, affect social behavior in both adults and children, has yielded over 100 published articles. She has a special interest in understanding how anxiety can bias our perception and production of nonverbal cues in ways that impede effective relationship building in contexts that range from the classroom to the courtroom. And finally, our moderator today, who helped set all of this up, and, well, sorry, Dr. Aaron, welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, and our moderator who helped set this up today is um, Pamela Council. Pamela is a professor at Georgia State University College of Law. And prior to that, she was a partner at Austin and Byrd, specializing in patent litigation. Pamela co-founded the Atlanta chapter of CHIPS in 2019. Um, CHIPS advances and connects women in tech and IP law and policy and accelerates innovation through diversity of thought and engagement. CHIPS makes an impact throughout, sorry, CHIPS makes an impact through conferences, programs, diversity initiatives, and community events around the world. So I will turn it over to Pamela. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you, Womble, for this awesome yeah. space. I know you guys have been working hard to make sure that <laughs> it will be ready for us. So we really do appreciate it. It, it was um, good to have a deadline. So. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. That's right. It's like planning a house party. Yes. <laughs> um, and thank you, of course, to Erin and Denise for being here. Um, I'm going to try to stay out of the way of what I think is going to be a really interesting conversation. But I would encourage everyone, if you do have questions as we go throughout, we really want this to be a conversation. Definitely, yeah. And so welcome those questions. Um, they have a wealth of expertise. Um, and it's been so interesting to just to see them work together. Um, but I thought I would kick off the discussion with sort of how this program came to be, because um, I received an ask from our board that was kind of like, oh, we're interested in a program. Maybe it looks like this. Maybe it looks like this. And I think I went back to my original email that I sent uh -huh. to Denise. Someone had identified her as a, a resource, as a jury consultant. And um, I, this is what I said, uh, and then you can pick it apart. I said, we're interested in understanding the courtroom perceptions of female experts, attorneys, and witnesses. And then I do give myself a caveat. I know from my own experience that this is a tricky topic. <laughs> and so I, I, I really just want to know when you got this email out of the blue in your inbox, sort of what would, what is your thinking around this original question and what came to your mind? Uh, a great question. And we didn't know at the time that we sort of knew each other That's right. from a past experience because I had consulted on a case in which uh, Pamela's husband was uh, trial counsel. So we had a little bit of a connection. But to your question, what 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 do people think of women experts, women lawyers? And I thought, OK, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> that was my honest uh, reaction. Here we go. And so how do I respond to this in a positive way and say, I'd love to be a part of a conversation, but let's talk about how we might dig a little deeper and, um, and sort of reframe the conversation. So because I get it most in, um, in jury selection, when the question will be, uh, do I want men with lawyers, you know, who aren't even hiring me, just want a little free advice. Here's my case. 
do my want women or men? Okay, well, that only eliminates like half the population, right? <laughs> and if you say, do I want women or men? Um, and so I, my pitch is it really depends on the woman or it depends on the man. And it depends on the issue of the case that you're trying. It depends on the dynamics. There's so many variables that it, we, we, we have such a desire in life, and especially as lawyers in a courtroom where there's so much unpredictability to be able to predict, right? To say, this is simple. If I can, if I know this, then I'll be okay. I can just, you know, look for women, look for men. <laughs> so um, I will use the example of, uh, in juror profiles in general, getting beyond just the, the sex of the juror. Um, if we were to look at uh, women who uh, are in a certain socioeconomic status and have chosen a certain thing to do for their professions and uh, are of a certain age group and a certain uh, racial identity, we could say that Marjorie Taylor Greene and Liz Cheney are both Caucasian blonde females between 45 and 55 years old, who are elected representatives in the United States Congress, in the Republican Party. They think and feel differently about almost every issue that we could name, right? Um, so if we even refine our profiles beyond women or men, um, to that we have to go, maybe that's not, maybe we're gonna really mislead ourselves. Um, instead of uh, giving ourselves some good information. So that same generalization about which jurors do, do I want sort of carries over, I think, to how do jurors perceive women lawyers? I mean, I'm looking at you and you all look like lovely people, but you aren't the same, right? Uh, and, and people will respond to different things about all of us, our gender identity being one. Who's the juror that is responding, right? Some jurors will respond differently to a female lawyer than a male lawyer. What's the subject matter? So there are just too many variables to be able to neatly um, answer those questions. And the same goes for experts. A little more research on experts, which we might deal with a little later. Uh, but, but I think having a deeper conversation um, where we can't so neatly define those answers is a more interesting conversation. So I applaud you for being willing to pivot, as we now say after COVID uh, times, and invite Erin to join us and see how we could kind of flesh it out a little more thoroughly. Yeah, and so Erin, I guess same to you. When you and Denise started talking, because I sort of put you guys in touch and said, okay, mm -hmm let's see what comes out of this brainstorm because you both had such great ideas. What was sort of your thinking around the initial topic? Oh, I was really excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really interested in you know, anxiety and relationships are what I study. And I think of the kinds of interactions that you're in in a courtroom setting is really anxiety provoking for everybody. Yeah. The attorneys have the stress of wanting to win. The jurors want to get it right. Mm -hmm. You've got an anxious defendant. You've got, maybe the judge isn't so anxious, but they're, you know, they're running the room. They want things to go in a certain way. So there is anxiety everywhere. And what, when I think about what you were, kind of what you set up, you've got all of these people with some aligning characteristics. Some are men, some are women, some are tall, some are short, some are smiley, some are you know, kind of more of a stern resting face add onto that a layer of anxiety and suddenly it's a funhouse mirror. Everything is distorted. <laughs> yeah. And so we're, we're not only uh, looking for shortcuts. We all want the, okay, if I, if I have the rules, I know I can choose the right people. Right. I can engage with this person in the right way, but the rules really, there really aren't rules. Um, and so that desire to avoid uncertainty leads us to create rules that aren't really there. So I got really interested in this, thinking about all of the complexity that goes into an already complex situation, and then just had a ball talking to Denise. Yeah, so. definitely. <laughs> Thanks for choosing her. <laughs> <laughs> Did pleasure. So if we're all, I mean, we're lawyers, most of us in this room, and many of the people you have the pleasure of working with, and so we've been trained to look for rules. I mean, that is like, Law School yeah. 101, like read the situation, find the rule, apply the rule. Um, and so perhaps this drives many of the common 
jury consultant offerings that I see, which is demographic profile, you know, charts upon charts about what you're looking for, who you're looking for based on, you know, some immutable characteristics, some opinion characteristics. And then on the other hand, reading body language. And so what is the utility, if any, in these? And sort of what is your perspective on these as tools for the trial attorney? So um, I think I would make a lot more money if mm -hmm. I would engage in establishing a juror profile because attorneys want them desperately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and saying yes when people um, ask me, can you read body language? Like if I said, oh, yeah, sure I can. You know, it's part of what I do. <laughs> that and your profile, man, that's how we do it. <laughs> and people love that because, right, both of those things mm -hmm. seem predictable. They're definable. If you tell me this, this is what I need to check off the list, this is, you know, I could do it. But um, so I'm kind of, we're kind of in the debunking the myth um, category, I think. Now, I think if we were to engage in a juror profile, the only one that's truly helpful for us would be a profile of who we don't want, right? We love to sit around and dream about our ideal juror. I mean, that's just fun for all of us. We want mm -hmm. somebody who's smart or somebody who's this or had this, you know, um, but we don't get to pick them. As you well know, those of you who are trial lawyers, we only get to kick them off. So while lawyers love to talk about who we'd like to see on the jury, and I'm happy to engage in that too, it's fine. What we really have to come down to is to talk about who we cannot live with because that's the only choice that we get to make. And if you're, I don't know, I would I guess a lot of you practice in federal court and in civil cases and you get three precious peremptory challenges. So there's not a whole lot that we get to do in state court. You know, it may be, it may be very different. So if we aren't going to... It, you know, if we find our ideal juror, chances are they're never going to serve. I mean, if you see that person sitting in the courtroom, don't fall in love because if, unless your opponent is asleep at the wheel or views the case very differently than you do, they're going to strike that juror, right? Just like you're going to strike their ideal jurors if you can figure that out. So I think finding out what is helpful for us to talk about um, is, is, has much more utility than do I want this checklist, men, women, old, young, uh, you know, what uh, other things that we might check off. So um, I think that um, in talking about, and I, and I realize many times in federal court, and it's different in different jurisdictions here in Atlanta, we tend to have it pretty good as far as federal court goes in terms of being able to ask questions. A lot of places you don't, but I'm way more interested in finding out about jurors' experiences. Um, and not only their their worldview, certainly, if we can, about uh, topics that um, would impact how they might view the evidence in our case um, and their reactions to the experiences. Um, not only have they had them, but what their reactions are. Um, maybe something like, do I think the juror um, is, an, uh, likes, is like an authoritarian type juror or likes authority or doesn't like authority? Those, I mean, depending on the, it's very case specific. So based on what's going on with your case and the dynamics of your case would really influence the kinds of questions I would try to get lawyers to ask mm -hmm. to come up with a, quote, profile or hit list, as it might mm -hmm. be. Like, we cannot, we, we, don't, we don't think jurors with this particular perspective or life experience or reaction to this life experience would be a favorable juror for us in this case. So it's a little more complicated. Yeah, I loved the idea of not only what is the experience that they've had, but how do they react? For instance, a theft. Have you ever been the victim of theft? Okay, sort of binary, but how did you feel about it? Some people feel very personally victimized. Other people, eh, it's just my stuff. I replaced it. I had renter's insurance. And I thought that was so interesting just to the, Yeah, think I think about. that's, as we talked about it, I will we'll use this example. I'm eager to hear it. Um, Karen talk about how well she can read body language. And <laughs> She's reading all of us right now. <laughs> I, I use this hypothetical. I know this isn't the kind of case you do, but if we are picking a jury for, and I'm representing the defendant in a car theft case, we would have to ask the question, have you or anyone close to you had their car stolen? I would answer the question, yes, I've had my car stolen, same car, four times. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't know my car was so popular. <laughs> but people loved that car. I finally took it to the lot because I couldn't keep dealing with what it. What car was it? It was a, that's a great question. <laughs> Back in the day, yeah. it was a Volkswagen Cabriolet. Do you remember those little Volkswagen convertibles? <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. And I'm talking like in the 90s. So I'm dating myself. <laughs> you said I'd steal that. But it was such a cute, yeah, such a cute little car. Uh -huh. And they would take all the parts off and make old VW Rabbits or something, new Cabriolet. So they would take the car, strip it. And then sometimes I wouldn't even know it's gone. I get a phone call, you know, we found your car. So you would think you would definitely not want me on the jury if you're representing the defendant. The reality is, even though I love that little red convertible, I'm not a car or thing person so much. So it was a pain to have to deal with it. But I didn't feel like personally violated because somebody stole my car. So actually, you know, I might be okay. My next door neighbor had her gas cap stolen and called 911. <laughs> All right. We reacted, you would say she's a minor victim, I'm a major victim, but that's not the end of the story. More to the point is how do we react to those experiences is a more predictive lens for how we're going to see the evidence in that particular case. So you have to be curious and if you can try to get underneath the obvious, mm -hmm. I think. And I think to build on that, one of the things that Denise and I found ourselves talking about is the idea of micro relationships. So you're, you've got this short window of time to connect with this person and learn what you can about them, learn how they respond to you. And we each elicit different things from different people. And so I think about rather than looking for characteristics, experiences, thinking about what, how can I build a tiny relationship with this person in the little bit of time I have to interact with them, engage what that feels like to me. I mean, you become, I, I try to say the therapist. And one of the things we talk about is you are your own most important instrument. The ways in which you respond to each client coming in, sometimes that's about you. Sometimes it's about what's going on in the room. So knowing yourself and knowing like, wait a minute, that person's not responding to this question in the way that people usually respond when I ask them. That tells you something really important that they're not verbal cues. Well, you know, you've got the person sitting here like this, which I do often. I'm not a tight, closed person. I'm not angry. I'm always freezing. Yeah, <laughs> so so nonverbal cues can mean all sorts of things. Instead, I think if you can look for patterns and you can use yourself as an instrument to think about, am I responding to this person in a way that suggests I can tell a story that they'll be able to hear and understand? Then you've got a chance of amplifying that relationship down the line. Will you speak a little bit more about what you talked about, about the, the sort of body language, the, the misleading? I mean, you gave a great example, mm -hmm. but people really do get invested in believing in it. Yeah. And you've had a little more experience, I think, in trying to bust that myth a little bit. Absolutely. That's so, and there was, the literature goes back and forth over the decades. And there's always some, like, kind of like the people who develop jury profiles. They've got something to sell. And like, here's how you tell people to lie. You look at yeah. a raised eyebrow and an arm like this. And if you try to replicate those, they never do. It, there, there's absolutely no clear pattern. You want to look at the patterns within an individual. So if you notice you're talking to me and I'm looking really relaxed through most of your questions, and then you ask something and something shifts, that's a data point. It's one data point. It could just be I got uncomfortable and I moved around. That's a good trigger to you to think of. So what's another question that I could test hypothesis here. Is there something going on with this person? You ask another, maybe a kind of pointed question, I do the same thing. Now you're learning, your my nonverbal cues are actually giving you something specific about the question you're asking and the way we're engaging. That's where I think nonverbal cues can be helpful. But what the cue is, Pamela and I could respond with great anxiety or anger to the same thing and we look entirely, entirely different. different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And people do believe that I can tell when somebody's lying, right? Because they led, they've read, if you look up into the left, it means you're lying. And if you look up into the right, it means you're thinking. 
And there may be something that says yeah. that, right? <laughs> but it's just like you said, it's it's not consistent. It's not, but but we think, oh yay, thank you. You gave me a rule. You know, I know yeah. how to do mm-hmm. this. But we really are like lulling ourselves into, you know, feeling some security that's not going to serve us well. Okay. And and I'll say this if you one more word about juror profiles, and I know you all may work with wonderful consultants who do ascribe to the theory and maybe you find it useful. Please don't do this. If you are doing a focus group or mock trial, I don't know if any of you here or watching remotely have had that experience before, maybe you have, but we're working with no matter how many times we do it, probably a relatively small number of people. Like we may work with 24 or 36 or 48 if it's a larger mock trial, something like that. And so people will say, well, the X, older people, the women, the less educated people, the whatever it is in this sample, all felt this way about us. So here's what we're going to look for. And I, or it'll, it'll even get more specific. Did you hear that HR worker, that a person that works in HR loved the case? I hope we get jurors who work in HR. Mm-hmm. All right. This is sample size of one, you know, when you, <laughs> when you are picking out that one person, mm-hmm. or even if you have 50 people, and all of the people in their 30s went for you, and nobody in their 50s did, the sample size is too small. So if you are ever going to get a reliable juror profile statistically, it's by people doing a phone or some kind of a brief online survey with numbers of people that are 200 or more. It would take that much of it. Aaron's way more versed in statistics than I am, but a sample size that large before you could ever um, have any reliability about whether one salient trait, be it their gender, their age, their education, would be a good predictor for you. And many times it's an interaction. It's not just yeah. that. And I was so, going to add to that. It's, it may be a proxy for something else. Right. So if, if women may be more likely to have been sexually assaulted. And so that's really what you're getting at, right? The gender itself, right? Exactly. It's exactly. their experience. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that, yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, there was um, uh, also you will have people come to you, and uh, you know, they they will seem to be agreeing with what's going. They, you can probably notice I am a nodder. <laughs> yeah. I will not at anything. I, people will have me come to their dissertation defenses because I will be so offended. <laughs> I, 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 I could hire out doing that, probably make more money than a professor. I don't always agree. <laughs> it's just reflexive. I, I am so trained to be nice that I'm going to support, like, yes, I hate what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> So you've got to be very mindful of that you may really think you, if you had me in there, you'd think, oh, we've got her. She is so exactly. Bored. You have no idea. I really may be thinking these people are crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm out of here. Have you guys had that happen before jurors at the end of the case where you're so sure they're with you and they come out and go, can I have your card? You know, I want to refer somebody to you. I hated your case, but I really yeah. liked you, you know, when I was responding I was responding to you. It it is tricky. I, a case I just worked on earlier in the year. I had marked this big X over a juror in my seating chart because he was he, he was kind of cross like this. Although I know, like you said, I'm cold in courtrooms a lot of times too. But he had this furrowed brow. And this look like he just you know was not going until he opened his mouth to talk, and then he became this different person. And I'm like. Oh, well, this guy's not so bad, you know? So I talked myself out of him that back into him and he was on the jury. And in fact, he was like the cheerleader, you know, for our case. Mm -hmm. So you really do um, have to, as you're saying, use many data points, not just one. Another thing I'll mention, we're maybe veering way off from where we're supposed to go here, but in trying to to, uh, look at jurors who you may want or not want in your case, here's what's really hard for me is you you can't just pick jurors whom you like. There may be, or who are, who are attractive, and I don't mean just physically attractive, but interesting to you. There may be jurors on the panel who are great and wonderful people that you would love to go have a glass of wine or a cup of coffee with, but will still not see the case your way, no matter what you do. 
Uh, so no, rec you've got to recognize that about, you know, about yourself. That's one thing about yourself as well as other people that I can't just pick people who I like um, and find interesting because they may or may not uh, be good for you in a, you know, in a particular case. And um, occupation is, is another one. Now, if we are in a situation where we're in federal court and we don't get much information at all, are we going to use some of these sweeping stereotypes? We probably have to just, we just got to know by default that don't think, you know, there's, uh, there's ironclad um, proof here. I'll, I'll give this example. Pamela mentioned the Unabomber case and many of you are too young to even know what that is, but as, as it might sound, it was a bomber. Um, and it was a case in which the uh, government was seeking the death penalty. So the only thing we're trying to do is not get that. I, I was on the side of the Unabomber trying not to get the death penalty. It's not a whodunit. He journaled for years and years and years and years and years. Um, and, you know, and he, and he was a mathematician. So he journaled an elaborate code. But do you know where he kept the key to the code? If you would guess with the journal, you would be right. So, you know, the code was only so helpful. It wasn't a question of who did it, just will you spare his life? And so we had a juror, potential juror who was a social worker, and we were going to present evidence of a mental illness. You might think a social worker would be great for us. So in the juror questionnaire, we had asked, um, have you seen any movies or read any books involving the death penalty? And this juror had read the book, uh, or seen the movie, I don't remember, Dead Man Walking. I don't know if you're, any of you are familiar with that, but it's a story of um, Sister Helen Prejean, who is a nun who vid Susan Sarandon played her in the movie. And, you know, it's a big movie. So it, that's a story of her sort of seeing people on death row and accompanying them to executions and all of that. Very dramatic. She puts down she's seen Dead Man Walking. What do you think or feel about any of the movie and the characters? She writes, that nun was a real creep. <laughs> the social worker, <laughs> you know, I wasn't looking for her to say the nun was a creep. So, <laughs> so we're tempted sometimes to go, oh yeah, but I want the social worker, right? When they tell us information that is incongruous to us, if we think that makes no sense, but I, I believe this to be true about accountants or about, you know, women lawyers or whoever it is. So I'm going to not believe what they told me. Please believe what they tell you, yeah. um, even if it's uncomfortable for you, because it's not what you think of mm -hmm. this type person. So anyway, that's just another be careful. Yeah. 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 And the the um, I think about just things that, that I think of as salient might be something like burnout. If you've got five social workers in the room, one is fresh and excited and really yeah. engaged. Great point. <laughs> One has been doing this for 20 years. She has watched so many bad things happen. She is done. And that very that's the variability that's much more important than mm -hmm. what what role do they play? What gender are they? Yeah. I think it goes back to experiences yeah. and the interpretation of those experiences. Exactly. And okay, so we've been talking about a lot about sort of the juror, like looking at each person individually, but do you ever consider how the group dynamics might impact their behavior and how do you, how do you account for that? And what have you seen? It's really important to consider. We don't always, again, know, but to think about, and um, certainly if you only have three peremptory challenges to exercise, they're very precious, or even if you have six, however many you have, um, so, yes, yeah, somebody could be a leader or have status, but all that's relative to the other people in the group, mm -hmm. right? So you have to try to look, and we none of us know, but imagine how this person is going to interact with others in the group. Um, I am very um, concerned in most cases about a juror who could become an expert in the jury room. Mm -hmm. um, and that is whether or not they have any true expertise um, in the subject matter. If they do, forget it. I mean, you better know that juror if they have any kind of credential or education or experience in an area that's an area in your case. You better be darn sure they are going to see the case your way or get rid of them or you're going to have them, quote, testifying in deliberations. But I try to ask questions also like if there's technology involved in the case. Um, 
do you consider, or let's just say even forensically, there's a technological issue. Do you consider yourself to be more knowledgeable or experienced than most other people about <coughs> IT or computer technology? Mm -hmm. Because many people who are not <laughs> any better than anybody else experience themselves as being that way and as part of their identity, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's important, it's important to know that. But I am uh, more likely sometimes to encourage lawyers to accept a juror that they really, really, really don't like over a juror that they kind of don't like if the one they really, really, really don't like is not likely to sway any jurors, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, because we can live with that. Mm -hmm. If a person really hates us, but it's going to go, okay, whatever you guys think, right? Mm -hmm. so then that person that. is not nearly as damaging mm -hmm. as somebody who we just mostly don't like, but we think is really going to have status in that jury room um, or be a leader or dig in and hold out. Mm -hmm. What questions do you ask if for someone to determine someone's going to be more of like a follower versus a leader? <laughs> That's a great question to ask. And sometimes... Um, Sometimes you get to, and this is so dependent on the court you're in, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can actually ask that question or even on a questionnaire mm -hmm. in, in what situations or do you consider yourself to be in a group dynamic or a follower or a leader? Mm -hmm. Or one of my favorite ones is in what kind of situation might you be a follower mm -hmm. or might you be a leader? Mm -hmm. And I love this one guy <laughs> once mm -hmm. in a case and said, in what situations might you be a leader? He says, when deciding where to go eat. Yeah. <laughs> You got yourself, man. I take control. When it's pizza or burgers, I'm the one. You need those um, people. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but many times, it is sort of just putting a putting a piece together of this of this jury. So, for example, sometimes I am looking at what they do. Are you a minister of a pastor of what size? congregation or the youth pastor, the main pastor, a counseling pastor, what do you do, you know, in your profession? So um, certainly if somebody is a CEO or, you know, has a, a any kind of a leadership role or elementary other jurors got to, pardon mm -hmm. me, um, an elementary school teacher. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they can, teachers can be a role mixed back because they can absolutely dig in it. How teachers are very different, right? But what kind of a teacher are they? So that's where I would try to get under that. If it's not somebody with quote, obvious status, um, like an executive or, or a lawyer is certainly a dicey person to put on the jury done it many times, but know the risk. You know, if you're doing it, there are two lawyers on the New York Trump jury right now. And I'm very eager to see if we get to hear from them afterwards, you know, how that plays out. But really, it's there's unless you're you're kind of putting in a lot of data points together to see. And sometimes, honestly, it's not what, you know, lawyers are going to talk about a lot. And we we have been taught in law school to uh, tone down or dis. Um, disregard our intuition. And I think that's a shame uh, because sometimes you really, whether it's a juror or somebody that you're interacting with in a courtroom or your opponent, you really have an intuition about somebody. And I'm not getting all mystic. No, it's true. But it's true. And if you do, just pay attention to that um, because it really might be telling, it may be just that that person's not being receptive to what you're saying, or they're giving off some kind of an indication mm -hmm. that that there's something to be aware of there, and you may be able to or not follow up on it. But but you do you do I think you do need to at least don't shut it out. Mm -hmm. You may not make every decision based only on that, but but pay attention to that. If you if there's something about that juror when they tell you their life experience that lets you think, oh, she or he is going to dominate <laughs> in that room, will not shut up, you know, um, is one of the things. And, you know, we all have those jurors, one or two, aren't there, in every panel who raise their hands to everything you ask. And that person may irritate the heck out of everybody else, and they'll go against them, um, or they may dominate people. It just depends on the other attributes of that person, I think. It also makes me think about down the line, once you're involved in the trial, you're part of the group, whether or not you're actually part of the group. So the ways of thinking about not just how you're going to interact with each juror, 
but how you've got a lot of power to shape the dynamic. And so how I think of this often in the context of teaching, I want to be connected to every person in the room, but I also want to be connected to the whole room. And I'm watching the ebbs and flows. Are people starting to get fidgety? Or are they looking away? I've got to pull them back in. And I think of that as very similar to a courtroom dynamic where you want to think about with given the people I've got, how can I draw them together in a way that might draw them together to me? Yeah, I mean, I think we've, like you said, you can't select the perfect jury, right? Or, or even down select to the perfect jury. So it becomes more of a question, I think, for us lawyers, what we can control is our presentation to the jury. So I want to start talking about that a little more, like whoever does get impaneled, those are our guys, right? right? And gals. So how do we present ourselves? How do we influence their behavior once they're ours? Well, so let me start with it from a psychologist yeah. perspective. Um, you both have a lot of control and absolutely no control. <laughs> so what you can control, you know your own range and you know your own impact on people. So I know when I need to make myself bigger, when I need to really be in charge, here's what I do. And I know what, how that affects a room. I also have a sense that, you know, what should I get a little smaller and let the room come forward to me? And so I think using, again, going back to the idea of yourself as an instrument, you know yourself better than you know anybody there, and you know what impact you can have. So I think you've got the opportunity to take your own range and impose it on the room in a way that works in your favor. Absolutely, and I think I'm, I'm interested in if any of you here or anybody that sitting in a chat have have you encountered when we started the conversation about as women lawyers, how are we perceived? Do you encounter things that you think are that you are encountering any dynamic in the courtroom that has to do with your gender that your male counterparts don't encounter? And that may be case specific, or it may be something you experience every time you're in the courtroom. Oh, I've got one. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had an experience when I was actually a really young attorney that because of a somewhat odd set of circumstances, I got to do several very important witnesses at a trial. I was maybe four years into practice. Um, and we, drew a largely older, largely female jury, um, wasn't the intent, just what we ended up with. And um, I took my first witness, which was an itty bitty little tiny one. And everyone, everyone that was associated with our side said, they looked at you like a proud grandmother. And I got two more witnesses. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I do think, I mean, I don't know that that would have been the same reaction had I been a young male just out of law school, you know, so and it worked for you. Yes, in that circumstance, I think it did. Okay. Um, Anybody else have anything that comes to mind? Yeah, so I guess um, I was at a trial in February and it was a patent infringement case and we had all women jury. And I didn't realize how rare that was until I spoke with Denise in the elevator. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the one time I've wow. had a trial where it's been all women in patent infringement, including the alternates. Um, and in terms of the teens, there was one female attorney on the other side, and I was the only one on our side. And in terms of witnesses, there was only one female expert on their side who looks very much like me, Asian, young-ish looking. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can go young. And very bright. You know <laughs> and so, and it was very clear to folks on our team that I needed to have a more active role. Um, and at least when I saw the, the women experts up, it felt like the, you know, sometimes the jurors were looking elsewhere, but like when she was up, they were all looking at her. Like mm -hmm. it was just, she was different maybe. And that yeah. was why they were looking at her so intently. And, and so, and so as a result, I mean, I think, I think that did drive a dynamic that if it's not, you know, women having an equal number of women to show that we also respect and want women to be heard. And that's why you see this person playing an active role at trial. Mm -hmm. I, I, so, yeah. I think people make such a mistake, trial teams, when they think um, we've, we've got to have a woman here because they're women jurors, but they give that woman one baby witness and mm -hmm. nothing else. It's I think like, it's worse. If you're, you oh, if you're going to do it, <laughs> you've got to, you know, you've got to go big and make that person yep. an equal partner in your team. So I like those examples a lot. And I don't, 
doubt that it that it had to do with did you have one Pamela too no it's okay I don't, I don't. <laughs> um, but but I want to um, think about too the qualities that we bring to the table other than uh, we are we are women lawyers that is who we are and so whatever jurors are going to think of quote women lawyers we got to bring it right because that's us but what else are we that jurors relate positively to and we know from research, and I'm sure Erin can say more than, than I can, that people are more easily persuaded by people whom they like, uh, by people whom they find identifiable. Um, they find those people more trustworthy and credible. Therefore, they're more easily persuaded. So in your example about the grandmother, your proud grandmother, you were also acting as though a granddaughter they would like to claim as theirs, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> there was something that came through about you that I would uh, guess is very authentic. I think my nerves probably showed. <laughs> but that, you know what? And we get, we get so worried about hiding our nerves when you talk mm -hmm. about there's anxiety and the whole thing. It's pretty authentic mm -hmm. when you don't, mm -hmm. right? You're likely to come off. And I don't mean, I would never ask anybody to feign it for, you know, sympathy or anything like that. But if you're nervous and you misspeak or you're quivering or whatever, comment on it and move on, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Everybody can identify with you at that moment because everybody has been there. So if you had been your, your exact, you know, visual appearance, who looked like you could have been their granddaughter, mm -hmm. but you acted differently, mm -hmm. then I don't think they would have wanted you to be their granddaughter mm -hmm. and, and re reacted to you in the same way. So I think we need to all be aware of our authenticity. That also gets kind of trained out of us in law mm -hmm. school. We're supposed to dress like this if we're a woman lawyer. We're supposed to talk like this. We're supposed to, you know, and bring more of who you are to the table and outside the courtroom. Think of yourself as the granddaughter, the friend, the soccer coach, the, you know, whatever reading club, whatever you do that's outside the courtroom, sometimes come from those places when you're talking to a juror, uh, because that's going to be um, what a juror is going to relate to the most. I think that's very important. And to add to that, when you were talking, it made me think about you can organize all social behavior along, around what's called a circumflex, and it's basically a circle. And one axis is about agency. So it goes from really in control to at the other end of the circle, really passive and just kind of, I want you to be in charge. The other goes from warm to distance. So if someone pulls you in versus someone who kind of pushes you away. And what we know is that around this circle, if, you behave, if your behavior is in one quadrant, so say the friendly dominant quadrant, which is generally where most of us fall um, and generally where you'd want to be in this kind of situation, you are pulling from the people you're talking to for complementary behavior. So it's on the same side of the circumflex. It's warm. If you're warm and friendly, you're pulling for a warm response from people. But you're also pulling for a follower response. So if you come in and you're you know, not arrogant, but you're <clears throat> calmly and friendly in control, the response you're likely to elicit from people is a friendly, submissive response. They want to follow you. She seems nice. She seems in charge. This, this makes sense. Where I think you get in trouble, and I watch when I watch scenes on the news from courtrooms where people are aggressive and they just seem mean. My immediate thought is, I don't care what they say. I don't want to be on their side. Mm -hmm. That's evoking for me a hostile response. So there are times when that's appropriate, but you want to really use it judiciously. I, and I think that's exactly right. It is responding to people um, in the way that's appropriate for not all witnesses because their witnesses on the other side are your enemies, right? And we know there's certain witnesses that jurors, if they're employees of the company, um, you, you need to respond to them in a different way than their expert who's who's not telling the whole truth or whatever it is. So in, in that instance, or if your opponent is doing something that he or she shouldn't be and you act with you know disdain when you make your objection or whatever you do, that's appropriate. 
But if you approach the entire case that way, mm -hmm. right, it's not going to get any attention. Um, your, your, your anger or your response is not going to seem, um, it's not going to underscore anything. Yeah. If yeah. you've, you know, it's like making a loud noise throughout the whole time. You need to be quiet in order for people to realize when you're being loud. So thinking about your genuine response to situations, witnesses, your opponent, honestly, the court, of course, um, jurors watch how lawyers, who do, you, like, who do you think they, most jurors, relate to most? If you think about all the people who are in the courtroom, who would you think they probably, most jurors or many jurors probably relate to the most? The, is it the lawyers? Is it the judge? Is it, who is it? Stenographer. <laughs> I think that's exactly right. She's just sitting there. Working, Absolutely. Just like they, they are. relate <laughs> way more to the court reporter to perhaps even the people, the courtroom officers that handle them, you know, on breaks and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Because not all, you're gonna have some professional people, all of that, but most people have been in those type, you know, not, not executive type management jobs. Mm -hmm. And so when you are nice to the court, well, it's just stupid <laughs> not to be nice to a court Amen. reporter. We all know that, mm -hmm. right? But when jurors show you treating people like that with the same respect you do the court and other lawyers, it goes a long way and it's just smart. And it's the same thing uh, with witnesses. You know, if there's a witness that's not hurting you, there's no need to go at it just because they're on the other side. And that makes them sit up and notice, right, who you are. So those are some kinds of things I think we, we can control. I, I want to not um, leave without saying a word about your original email when I admitted to my uh, little bit of an eye roll, uh, which led to a great great conversation about women experts. Mm -hmm. um, this has been researched, I think, more than anything else that you asked. Um, how do people perceive women, women witnesses and women expert witnesses? And the research is not necessarily consistent, um, but because there are so many variables, I think. Like we found this in one study, but we couldn't replicate it here. There are so many interactions so what, what some of the variables are, so are female wit, uh, expert witnesses regarded in the same way by male jurors and female jurors? You know, we're talking in broad brush strokes if we say that, right? Um, but it has to do with also the subject matter they are testifying about. So where I think we might know in advance there may be a bias is if a, a woman expert witness is testifying in an area that is considered to be a male dominated area. So if a, an expert witness is testifying about construction as opposed to cosmetics, mm -hmm. you are going to have some people on the jury, men and women, think that that's not as likely an expert. You know, It has to do with the complexity of the testimony. So like DNA is perceived as different as something else. Is that gonna be so? You know, there are so many variables that it's just hard to say. Jurors perceive female experts in this way. Um, and I think it comes down to, well, this is one thing I thought that was interesting. Um, the research shows that women are on average more reliable eyewitnesses. You all probably don't deal with eyewitnesses as much, but than men are. But men are more confident. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that surprising? Sorry. <laughs> in their testimony about what they saw, even though they're not more reliable. So jurors can pick up on the confidence of the testimony, and that can be what's more persuasive, more than the fact that it was a male testifying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're just, again, so many, they're great questions to ask because um, it may be something you can address in voir dire, in fact. Um, we have, you know, would any, does anybody think you might be more likely to believe a male witness who testifies about X than a female witness. Some people do feel that way. Let me know who it is. I always try to, you know, frame questions in the way that people aren't going to be um, ashamed to say yes, like you're agreeing with me, because those aren't bad people. We just need to know who the heck they are, right? Um, and in asking the question, sometimes even if people don't answer it, it allows them to at least address their own biases or be aware of them. 
And it doesn't necessarily mean it's a closed minded or misogynistic person. I, you know, there are many people who, when they hear a female voice on the airplane announcing that they are captain so-and-so going to be flying the plane from, uh, you know, Atlanta to Bangkok are, are a bit nervous that it's a woman. And maybe they're just not used to it. Maybe they've never heard, maybe it just isn't what they expected, but making people sit with that and go, no, come on, why is that? You know, Mm -hmm. um, is part of what we can do, I think. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And I also think that I, I really like that idea of normalizing both sides of the response that, you know, there's not a right answer here. Yeah. Um, just really want to know what the range is. So I think a lot of times people will be looking to you either to find ways to get out of this. I don't really want to be on a jury. And as someone who <laughs> has done that several times. <laughs> Successfully, I've heard you've never been on a jury. Never been on a jury. <laughs> um, but also other people who want to please you. They want to get things right. So giving them an out, like there's really not a right or wrong that really can open you up to getting information that's more valuable and useful in the long run. Yeah, most definitely. Do you feel like as well, asking that question ahead of time can basically make somebody cognizant that they might have um, subconscious bias and I think work I th- against that? I think it can. So, I mean, are you saying would asking it um, or what, cause them to be aware of it and maybe deal with it? Or would it be bad for you to ask it? If I was thinking it would be good for you because it'll it'll make them. I think that's right. And it will not only, a lot of people, um, people are a lot of times so afraid to ask a question in voir dire uh, because of the answers they're going to get. Or because of, and remember, we learned, we need to learn to love the answers we hate. I'm looking for bad answers. Mm -hmm. Good answers do me no good because it's going to make the other side strike you. So, but, but I do think if you find it out, you're golden, right? Because you can say, well, can you tell me what you would do if a female expert did testify about that? And if they stick with, well, I wouldn't believe her like the male counterpart, you can probably get them off for cause. Mm-hmm. But what are other people doing while you're asking, while you're having that conversation? They're thinking about themselves. Mm-hmm. And so I think it can make some people come to go, well, now that you mentioned it, you know, would I offhand think of that and be so careful that they don't? Right. And it sure as heck can make others in the jury room, if it were to ever come up in deliberations, be alert to say, you know, we, we talked about this or, wow, you are one of those people, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But also I think it's just good in general. So I enjoy uh, bringing out biases. So when I was working at the law firm, my favorite was, oh, are you a paralegal? And so I would always go, I need you to tell me what it is about me in particular that you're assuming I'm a paralegal. Right. And I would just have a pregnant pause, right? <laughs> yeah. And so like, finally, like, I did it for like, it wasn't for me, it was for like the next young yeah. person. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when you're bringing up this, I feel like it's just like a life lesson in general. Like it may not be applicable to this case, but maybe for like the next case, it can just, yeah. yeah. So I, I lean into, I, I enjoy it when people have assumptions about me and I ask them, and isn't Why, that, where is that coming from? Isn't it great yeah. when you can lean into yeah. it and not um, be what would be understandably like just defensive about it? I think it um, comes with age too. And yeah, then like yeah. being more secure in your career when you know that, you know, and, like, you probably get a job someplace else, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Challenging, right? right. It's something like right. ever like happened. So, I mean, that just comes with like, experience. <laughs> but like, um, and, and realizing it really does say, it's really not a statement on you. It's a statement about, them Mm -hmm. and being curious about it Mm -hmm. right about like where does that come from and if we can get to that place with with jurors or even Mm -hmm. witness it catches people off guard if you lean into things sometimes even witnesses right um if they respond one way to you and you respond a different way back it's just it's it's fun to do that i think yeah and i did like aaron like a nice nodding yeah Yeah. I've had the leaning into it experience too with a couple of um, older male witnesses who've mansplained to me as I cross-examined them. And um, I mean, it's it's really hard, I think, in the moment to figure out how to play that. Yeah. <laughs> but one time it um, 
I th it's hard to know what impacted the jury's ultimate decision, sure. right? But I think one time it hurt them just because they didn't like the guy and the other side needed him to be liked. Right. And then another time, I think, I don't know that his person, his demeanor towards me caused him any trouble, but I do think he thought I was not as bright as someone cross-examining him should be. And I think I got some admissions out of him that had he been more on guard, I would mm -hmm. not have gotten. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, it can hurt the witnesses. And you want to, you want to get all these admissions out before he figures out how bright you all are. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. So go ahead and just while we're rolling here, let yeah. me get, let you, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, exactly. And then you think, what is, quote, the jury thinking of that? Well, there could be some jurors who think, thank goodness he's explaining that to that poor young woman. And there are others who are going, how dare he, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that may be what they talk about in the back. Like, it's yeah. not going to be one response. Yeah. Um, but again, responding with your authenticity is really all you can, all you can do. Yeah, and I, something that Tariana said that made me really think, is that the, the distinction between, you can ask the same question in a way that's defensive or is curious. Mm -hmm. Curious is so much more likely mm -hmm. to get you interesting things. Exactly. And if it's coming from a genuine, authentic place, you really do want to know. Like, I, I really want to know what you think of me, but help, tell me more. When they're coming at you in a, maybe an aggressive or an off-putting way, if you can lean in like, ooh, more, tell me more. It, it works. We find that as psychotherapists, really powerful that when people push you away or try to offend or hurt, that sidestepping that, just like, ooh, now something interesting is happening, mm -hmm. gives you a lot of power to get the information that's really useful to you and ultimately to the case. Exactly. Yeah. Well, this has been so great. I do, we are about out of time, so I'm glad we well, just transitioned <laughs> to questions. You guys are so great. If you do have more questions, let's keep the conversation going. I think we have from our lovely host here at Womble, another half hour at the bar. Um, so please uh, make yourselves at home. I would be remiss if I didn't just put a quick plug in for the Inta pop-up happy hour that Ships is having. So this is a giant IP conference is having in Atlanta. You should leave oh. town. Um, <laughs> um, there will be thousands of people from all over the world, mostly lawyers, again, leave town. Um, but it's going to be great. There's a pop-up happy hour um, at the Omni um, lobby bar. So right where the conference is taking place on May 20th from 4 to 6 p.m. So um, it's open to members and prospective members. So please bring a friend or whoever you met um, that day at the conference. All are welcome. Um, and then, of course, thank you, Aaron and Denise. And Either. thank you, Christy and Womble for hosting us. This has been a really great conversation. Do we have any questions so on the chat? Olivia or from the chat? I checked. Nope. Okay. <laughs> and thank you to our participants online as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right. Thanks. 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 Thanks.